Let's try five bucks, okay? Whoever is the first one that comes and takes this, it's yours. Whoever's the first one that comes and takes it, it's yours. Whoever, it doesn't matter. Whoever is the first one that comes and takes it, it's yours. Come and take it. Come and take it.
Let's go, Joshua 10 and verse 12. Then Joshua spake to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O son, stand, stand, stand still at Gibeon, and I'll moan in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still. This guy's amazing. He said, he, he looked at the sun and said, Sun, stand still. In the next verse, so the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. That's just amazing. This guy, John, that I'm talking about, though, John the Baptist, he's greater than him. Greater than him. Uh, I'll just keep reading here. And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. Next verse. There was no light and day like that before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Man, I've got a lot of stories of Elijah. I tried to narrow them down. But Elijah, if anybody's read about Elijah, I mean, he did so many things. Uh, let's go 17, 1 Kings 17, 1. Uh, I'll skip around. Uh, boy, that's the, now Elijah the Tishba, the Tishba, who is... Of the settlers of Galilee said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. In the book of James it says that for three and a half years it didn't rain by, because of the word of the man. For three and a half years. So then it didn't rain in verse, jump down to 16, 17, 16. Uh, he went to this... Uh, woman, I, I can't think of what she's called right now, she had no husband, she was a widow, there you go, she, he went to this widow and um, he said bake me a cake, and they're, like, they're going to get their last meal, but he said if you'll do what I say, that, that nothing, you, you, you'll you keep on eating, and there in verse 16 it said the bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of gold become empty, according to the word which the Lord had spoke through Elijah, in verse 17, now it came after these things that the son of the woman became sick, and it was so severe that there was no... He died. He died. Now up to this point in the Bible, nobody had ever been raised from, raised from the dead. I mean, that I know. Well, I didn't see anyone in the Bible that anybody had been raised from the dead. And then in verse, I think, 22. It's kind of hard to mark that in here, but... Yeah. The, the, the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived I mean, this, this guy is amazing that nobody had ever raised the dead, and I, but yet Elijah did. That was the first time this had ever happened, and yet John the Baptist was greater than him. Man, I could just keep on going on. Uh, go 1836, 1 Kings 1836. Oh, this is where, you, you know where he called down fire from heaven, right? And, and it consumed the sacrifice. Uh, he was um, going against the gods of Baal, and, or the uh, priest of Baal, and he was the priest of God. And they, they went through all this stuff, and he let them do whatever they wanted them to do, yet they had no fire. And then he walks over there, and, and he prayed a prayer, and boom, fire came down from heaven and burned up the sacrifice. Uh, Elijah, he crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. The same thing that Elisha did. Uh, Elisha was another prophet. Uh, he had the poisonous stew that the people were going to die from, and he threw some meal in it. And uh, let's see, Naaman was healed of leprosy. Uh, even this, the uh, Second Kings six and one. Now the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, "Behold, the place before you, we are." Living is too limited for us. Please let us go to the Jordan to each take from there a beam. Let us make a place there for ourselves so that we may live. So they're going to go cut some wood. Keep going. The one said, Please be willing to go with your servants. And he answered, I'll go. So they're asking Elisha to go with them. So he went with them. They came to the Jordan and they cut down trees. But as one was fallen a beam, the axe head fell into the water and he cried out and said, Alas, my master, it was a bard. For it was a bard. It was a bard axe. The man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. He cut off a stick, threw it in there, and it made the iron flow. I mean, that's just a 
amazing. These stories are just awesome. I mean, have you ever seen an accent float, Justin? That's, that's awesome. It's something so little, yet it's totally against everything, every other law that there is that says that whatever, I don't know, can metal float? Not that you know of. You're, so it just goes against everything, gravity and the way water, whatever, all those laws that work. So, and then the, uh, the, Armenian, the Armenians, they try to capture Elisha. Uh, if y'all remember that, uh, they come to him and had a whole thing, whole his house surrounded. And the servant said, "There's more." Uh, he's uh, the servant said to Elisha uh, that they're going to capture us, and Elisha said, "No, there's more with us than there is of them." And then God opened his eyes. Remember that story? And the whole mount around him was fought, was chariots of fire. You know, y'all remember that? You may read that. Anyways, what I'm saying is. Jesus said John the Baptist is greater than these guys. He was the greatest that's ever been born of women. The greatest. And that's because he was coming to say, to clear the way of the Messiah. But he also said in Matthew 11, that him who is least in the kingdom, in this kingdom, least, the sorriest, is greater than him. And I know, I, I, I'm sure I've preached on this before. But if you think that you're the, the, if you think you're the lowest, sorriest Christian in this kingdom, you're still higher and greater than John the Baptist. Therefore, greater than everybody that's ever existed and ever been born of women. All these prophets were greater. And you know, Moses and Elijah and all those guys look to a day that we live in. And yet, we look back and think, I wish that we could have been there. I've actually heard people say that. I wish I could have been there at Mount Sinai. I wish I could have been there and seen the mountain and all this stuff. We're greater than all those guys. Every one of them. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7. I got this in the NLT because it made much more sense, I thought. The old way, which laws etched with laws etched in stone, led to death. What, what's that talking about? The Ten Commandments, yeah. With laws etched in stone, led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. This is what I was talking about. Whenever he was up there and he came down, they couldn't even bear to look at him because his face shone so brightly. So they had to put a veil over his face. For his face shone with glory. With the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. As he left God, his face began getting dimmer. But by the time he reached the people, it was still so bright that they couldn't stand it. That means they could have never stood to be in the presence of God. Uh, the next one. So we should expect far greater glory under the new way. We should be expecting far greater glory. Now that the Holy Spirit is giving life. If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious... How much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? See, we are perfect in Him, and we are right with God. In fact, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? I mean, I, we just got to get this stuff inside of us, that we are so much better than what they were. We are, and we, we don't have to worry about all that law and but I had asked the question to a couple of people a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if I put these scriptures up there. Um, have I got like Genesis? Yeah. I don't have, I mean, I haven't wrote down here, but I had asked this. Well, I'll just read this. I was reading the Bible and I, I could not, I didn't remember this before. This is talking about Jacob. So you got Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob changed his name to what? God changed Jacob's name to, come on, you Bible scholars. God changed Jacob's name to a nation today. Israel, correct. Right. So, this is Israel. Israel, you know, the Israelites, this is Israel. And this blew me away when I seen this. He came to a certain place, this is Jacob, and he spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. 
He had a dream. Behold, a ladder was set on the earth with, with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angel, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to your descendants. This is the nation of Israel. He's going to give them all this land. Your descendants, your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the east and the west and the north and the south, and in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, so this was a dream, a vision. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took up the stone which he had put under his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured out oil on top of it, or on his top. He called the place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Do y'all get the story? Do y'all understand what I'm saying? You know, he had this vision, and God told him all this stuff. Okay. Then Jacob made a vow, this is what blew me away, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on my journey, on this journey that I take, and give me food to eat and garments to wear, if you'll do this, I will, and I'll return to my father's house to safety, then the Lord will be my God. And I thought, He wasn't this God already. You're talking about Israel, the nation of Israel. You're talking about Jacob. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's God wasn't already him. He had left his father's house to go find a wife. And he went to this place and God met with him there. And that wasn't his God. And then he said, if you do this, then I'll make you my God. What? This is what I said. I asked people this. They're like, I don't know. And then I was, I was writing this message out. This popped back up in my head. And the first thing that popped in was, have I got uh, maybe John? This is what popped right back up in my head. After eight days, his, his disciples were again inside. Thomas was with him. Jesus came, and the doors had been shut, stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your hand and your finger and reach your hand into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. So this was proof. There again, Thomas didn't believe. But when he did see it, he said, now you're my Lord and my God. The same as Jacob in the Old Testament. Amen. That said, if you'll do this, I'll make you my Lord and God. And I just, I, I, I can't hardly understand that because we talk about Israel being such a mighty nation. God's chosen people. And yet the God that was named Israel didn't even make him his Lord and God until he did some stuff, you know? Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? This is what came back in my memory. Blessed are they who do not see or did not see and yet believe. Amen. The only reason Thomas believed was because he seen. The only reason Jacob believed is because he did something. Blessed are you when you believe and never see. You know, we're, we call ourselves Christians. We believe that a guy just got up out of a grave after being dead three days, rose again, defeated death, defeated hell, defeated the grave, ascended to heaven, and gave us the Holy Ghost. We believe this. But do we really believe it? Do you really believe it? Because if you really believe that, you should really believe the rest of it. And I'm not trying to get on to anybody. Or, I'm just saying that we're some blessed people. Amen. God don't have to prove himself to me. Not like he did back then. Why? Because the thing is, is everything they talked about in the old, and even when Jesus was here, which was still really the old, it's all proof now. It's already been done. It's already been accomplished. They were looking forward. We're looking back. That's why I said we're walking from a victory. We're not going in there. We're not in battle. We're walking. The, the battle's already been won. He's already defeated him. Um... And you know, what, what's, the, what's the biggest thing? If somebody gets saved the next day, what kind of thoughts are we going to have? Right. 
Somebody gets healed. What's the next, the very next symptom that pops up? What's going to pop up in their head? I'm not healed. The very next day after you've decided, you know what? I know I don't see the money, but you know what? God, he's going to supply my needs and he knows I need this. What's the very next thought that's going to pop in your head? It ain't going to happen. Why? Why do we have those thoughts? Us to believe it. That's the very first thing. He does not want us to believe it. And I heard Andrew say this. Think about Eve. This, this is amazing. Think about Eve in the garden. Was she perfect? Before she sinned. That's what I'm talking about. In the garden. Yeah. After they sinned, they got kicked out. In the garden, she was perfect, right? Yeah. Never known pain. Never been hungry. Never been cold. Had everything they needed. I mean, didn't even need clothes. You know? Just perfect. And yet, a talking snake, a talking snake made her believe that she was miserable. Because he said, you can be like God. So he made her think that she was like him. So, if that happened then to a perfect person, do you not think that us bunch of miserable people that he can convince us that we ain't got it all? You know, we've had pain. We've dealt with loss. We've had hunger or cold or hot. Or I'm pretty sure he can convince us pretty good that we ain't got everything. Those are the things that give us that sort of false evidence. Correct. If you felt pain, well, then you know Oh, well, I'll feel pain again. I'm not healed. Because I know what that feels like. I said a couple weeks ago. Well, I'll get there in just a second. But we got to believe that in our spirit we have power, righteousness, holiness, perfection. Matthew 11, 12. So here's the next verse. After 11, 11, where it says, Of all the, John was the greatest, yet he was least in the kingdom is greater than him. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heifers suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. And sometimes I wonder, why did they translate it like this? Because it seems so hard to understand. Does that, Drew, does that seem hard to you? Kind of hard to understand, right? So I looked up all these words, and I, I already knew kind of what they were talking about. One thing is that we're not fighting flesh and blood. But he says from the from the uh, days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, of heaven suffers violence. That means, it doesn't mean that it's, it's a violent war. It means it's forcibly entered. The kingdom of heaven, from the days of John the Baptist, prior to that, nothing. And if you'll remember, he told, uh, Jesus told the Pharisees that they were keeping people out of the kingdom. He said, you won't go in yourself, nor will you let anybody else come in. Because they had all these rules and regulations. And they, so from that day until this day that Jesus said this, the kingdom of heaven was forcibly entered. You had to force your way into it, but you could get in. And then he says, and violent men take it by force. Uh, violent men means a forcer. That's somebody that, in other words, if you suffer violence, you would be the guy. So that's a forcer, somebody coming in. Take it by force means to seize it for themselves. So it says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is forcibly entered, and the forcer seizes it for themselves. He gets in for himself. And what I was going to say a second ago, a couple weeks ago, I said that we're too passive. I, don't, I didn't even really know what that word passive meant, but I've heard it used and thought it meant just whatever happens, I guess. That's what I thought it meant. So, and it kind of does. But I'll look that word up, and it means allowing what happens without active force or resistance. You allow what happens without active force or resistance. So, that would be like you standing up here, and I just push you, and you just fall over. Just kind of whatever happens. You never force or resist me. 
That's what passiveness is. That's what <laughs> much of us are, much of the church. I mean, nationwide, worldwide. And in James, I believe it says, uh, to resist the devil, he'll flee from you. So we have to have some resistance against the devil. And this is what it's saying here, that the violent take it by force. The, the forcer, they have to seize their way in. They have to force their way in, and they seize it for themselves. Well, when it said this, I was thinking about this biography I just read on Wigglesworth. The stuff that he did. How he always said, I only do what God tells me to do. The thing was, God told him to do some crazy things, but he just did it. But he knew that the kingdom of heaven could forcibly be entered. For instance, uh, a doctor, a doctor brought a guy in on a stretcher, and he walked up to the stretcher and uh, punched the guy in the stomach. And he was a big dude, uh, Smith was. And he was kind of a violent man anyway, prior to being saved. But um, he punched the guy in the stomach, and the doctor said, You just killed him. And he felt for a pulse, and the dude was dead. And Willsworth just went back, right back up on the stage and went to preaching. And about like three or four minutes later, the guy jumped up, totally healed. And they had questioned him before, why do you do these crazy things? Like, they gave him a baby one time, and he took the baby from the stage and kicked it like this. Like, and he kicked it, and it landed in the front row, totally healed. And they said, why do you do this stuff? Why are you so violent? And he said that he was just angry at the devil, and he seen demons, and he kicked and hit, did whatever he had to do to get them off the people. Ain't that so? This little boy, I was reading, this little boy had stomach issues and the, they called for him to come to the house and pray for the boy. And when he got there, the mom said they had done x-ray after x-ray and they can't find out what's wrong with his stomach. But he, he's going to die because he couldn't eat. He could never eat anything. He would, he would eat. I don't even think he had an appetite, but if they forced him to eat, they thought it was in his head originally, the doctors did. But anyways, he was dying of starvation. And Willsworth went there and looked at him. And uh, you think what he did. He cast a demon off. That's what he did. He, ca he cast a demon off. And which the woman said, my son ain't got a demon. And he said, yes, he does. So he cast a demon off of him. And the little boy started throwing up and threw up a worm that was in his stomach. A very long worm. What was healed? Healed. The doctors couldn't even find it. With the x-ray machine. But I think about this. And that is exactly what we should do. We should, like Drew, you love your wife, right? You love her so much that if somebody tried to hurt your wife, you would in turn hurt them, right? That's how we should feel about sickness and disease, even on other people. If you love her so much, you would hate evil that tried to come against her. We should hate evil as much as we love good. The Bible says that God hates iniquity, which is sin. He hates it, and he hates the results of it. That's how we should be. We should hate sin. We should hate sickness, disease. It should never be able to come against us. You know, sometimes when you get home and you, you just had a rough day, you kind of don't feel good, and you just kind of want to go with the bed because... Maybe you just ain't feeling it. And so we kind of, we're passive and we give in to it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It hits you with zero resistance. We never resist it, and resist it and stand against it. And I have just recently started resisting things and standing against it and said, no, it's not going to happen. But you you got to get worked up and get mad, you know, because it's, Otherwise, you're just passive. Otherwise, you just let it happen. If you don't get, if it, if it doesn't make you mad, and that's why we should hate evil as much as we love good. Um, Ephesians four. I'll flip there. Mm 
25, let's see. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. What does that mean? And do not let the sun go down in your anger. I think it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. The next verse. Neither give place to the devil. What does that mean? Does anybody know? Go back to 26. Be angry and sin not. I thought for years, I, I mean, I seriously thought this meant what I thought it said. I thought it said, you can be angry and not sin. Don't go to bed if you're mad. That's what I thought it said. This, is that right? You think that? That's what I thought it said. Don't go to bed angry. So, <laughs> that's crazy that we think that. Everybody thinks that. So, it says be angry and sin not. So, that means that you can be angry and still not sin. That means that there can be a righteous anger. Right? No? So, God don't see your thought life, right? So you can be angry at people. Just don't speak it out. It's all right. But it says be angry and sin not. So to me now I can see that there is a righteous anger. There's, there's something you can stand for that's right. It's righteous. That it's okay to have a... It, just because you're mad and angry doesn't mean that you're mad and angry in a bad way. This is in a good way. Because you're not sinning. Does that make sense? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath or your anger. Let not the sun go down. That means don't let your anger go to bed. Stay angry. I see this totally different now. It means stay angry. Because if you don't stay angry, the next verse says, neither give place to the devil. If you don't stay angry, you'll just give place to the devil. So it's saying, make, have you a righteous anger? And don't let the sun go down upon it. Don't let it go to sleep. Because if you do, you'll get complacent. You'll get whatever that word was I used a second ago. Uh, what? Passive. Is that what I said? Yeah, it was passive. So it, it says, don't let your anger at the devil go to sleep. Um. The Old Testament, if we if we see like how Israel was, how Jacob was, it was always, if you'll do this, then I'll make you my God. It was always, bring it to me. Bring it to me. You know, it was always, but this New Testament is more like, come and take it. It's yours. Just come and take it. That's exa exactly what I was trying to show with the, with the money there, because that's how it is. If he's already done everything, that means it's available. And I, I mean, I can show you throughout Scripture that He's already given us peace. He's already given us, He's already made you righteous. He's made you holy. He's made you perfect. He's, but you've got to go and take it. And the reason I didn't say get it is because you'll fight resistance. You've got to take it by force. But you can take it. It's yours. I, I really believe that. Um... Is this helping anybody? It really just shows me that talking about being passive, the lie is that God is in control. So we have become to be passive because if everything that comes at us is from God because he's in control, then are we supposed to fight against it? Right. So, yeah, we just let it happen. And that's, that's just a confusion. From the devil. Well, I think I was, me and Tim Howe was talking this week, and I think that there was, uh, I was telling him, I think there's like three different types of people. You got the, the people who believe the entire Bible, as it's written, don't, 
they think signs and wonders are still here. They, they don't think apostles left. They just, they just believe like, like I think I believe. Just they believe every bit of it. They believe the righteous and holy and, and there's no law. It's all grace. And then you got the second people that kind of believe that. But they never see any fruit. And because of that, they're in a... They're like riding the fence. They would be better off to be this third group of people which believes nothing. They just go to church. They believe all signs and wonders are done away with. There's no apostles. And it's easier to be that group of people than it is actually to be any of them. Because you ain't got to have faith for nothing. And so... I guess you just got to decide what you, the, the passiveness in just saying, well, just whatever happens, happens. That, I, I don't see that. I don't see that God's in total control. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. That's a pretty, for Jesus to say that is a very um, hard word. I mean, to just say, I've seen that verse forever, and I've kind of understood what it meant, but then when I broke it down and I've seen that it's it's forcibly entered and you have to seize it for yourself, you kind of got to be violent about it. And that doesn't mean it's a righteous. We see, I think we say the word violent as a bad way. We're not supposed to be Correct. violent because we're good Christians. Correct. But there's a righteous violence. There's a righteous anger. There's a right way to do this. And it's to say... If you see something coming against you and you don't think it's right because you see something different in the Word of God, that's when you stand up and say, no, I'm not going to have this. This is not the way this is going to go. This is not who I am. That's just like that song I was saying that I was listening to. You say I'm loved when I don't feel a thing. When I feel hated, he says I'm loved. So what are you going to believe? Your feelings or the Word? That's whenever the word should mean more to us than anything else. I, I just, I see it more now than I've ever seen it. it, it just, it's nonstop. This kingdom, this kingdom that we live in is a spiritual kingdom. And if you're born again in spirit, if you're born again, you're made brand new. You look just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. All this stuff intertwines together and it makes so much more sense. But sometimes you say, well, how do I get this from here to here? It's, it's got to be forced. It forcibly has to be done. You have to seize it for yourself. It's not an easy thing. You will hit. Resistance will come against you. Don't worry. The devil will tell you every lie and every, everything that you... I have it every time I have to stand up here in front of y'all. You can't do that. You're not good enough. You're not this. You're not that. And I, I am in him. And so are you in him. We are who he says we are. I mean, think about it. If your dad was the king of the universe, what would he not give you? Seriously. Is that too hard to think of? How about if he was the king of Persia or America or Tennessee? Can we take, take it down to if your dad was the Governor of Tennessee, would he not do everything to help you? But we serve the king of the universe. I'm talking the king of kings, the lord of lords. I mean, he loves us, guys. He loves us a lot. And you know, that's... Go ahead, everybody stand up. We'll finish here. Does anybody got anything else they want to add?
one that like never goes to church and doesn't read the Bible or seem to have a relationship with God and they come in and they just get healed and then there's someone who goes to church and they tithe and they read the Bible and they walk like a Christian walk and they don't get healing and um, what he said hit me even though um, like I, I have thought about that and I have wondered about that and why does this happen and it just doesn't seem to make sense and what he said um, what he more said was that like and I, I know these things but what he said then it just hit me different um, that with God everything is by grace and you're not entitled you don't deserve it and um, Romans 11 6 is by grace and not works and you don't earn the gifts of God Again, they're by grace, and um, he was going over the story of the centurion and how he was so humble and how much humility he had, even though he was someone with so much authority and was used to people, you know, jumping at his commands. Like he knew who Jesus was and his authority, and he 